Hello, Jordan. Hello, Michael. What's up? Episode what? 104? Five. 105. 105. Wow. Mm-hmm. Let's go. I got I got something for you here. We got an email this morning. I assume you haven't seen it yet. You assume I of course I haven't seen it yet. Actually, it was from yesterday. Mr. Jesse Rosenthal, by the way, this is just a complete humble brag uh, to everyone listening. Hey, Mike and Jordan, happy new year. I just wanted to reach out to you guys and let you know how much I appreciate both of you. I realize that I've been in the mentorship for about three years now, and I've made a ton of progress in that time. 2022 was the best year yet for my business, and I could not have done it without you guys. I remember just wish, wishing just a couple of years ago, I had a business which was half the size I currently have. And I still feel I have a long way to go. So thank you guys again and see you in the next live Q&A. Shameless plug, sales tactic. Jesse's the man. Jesse's jacked out of his mind, by the way. Um, But uh, we do have a sale coming up for the mentorship in roughly one month. Get on the email list if you're not on it already. That's where the notifications will go. Thoughts, Jordan? Jesse's awesome, man. Jesse is, he's jacked out of his mind. Like every time I see his post, I'm like, dear Lord, this guy is fucking yoked. Makes me want to do more curls. <laughs> Truly. I, I just, I love that. Like he's doing so well. He's been in there for, for about three years and like he shows up to basically every single Q&A, like almost every single one he's there. I'm not surprised to hear that he's doing very well. Like he's there all the time. He's putting in a ton of work. Like he walks the walk. He talks the talk. He's like, he, he's just a badass. So I love that. So huge props to Jesse. Um, and yeah, man, that's amazing. Shout out Jesse. Is your, is your video on? Yeah. Oh, you can't see me. It, I did see you, but then it like, it stopped working. I think it might be. It's definitely uh, hotel oh, it's a internet. Live video will return when the internet improves. Yeah. It's your mm. hotel internet. Oh Got man. It. Is it's this going to be awkward? No, no, it's okay. It's okay. okay. Because it's pick, it's recording my end, it's recording your end. We're good. Yeah. But yeah, yes, yeah. New York City hotel uh, internet for today's pod flew in for four days with Gary. Bro, I'm actually really enjoying New York City right now. Really? Mm-hmm. It was because Gary was in such a good mood. No, just yesterday, like coming in, kind of nostalgic. It's been a while, staying in the city. Um, uh what's or not what's that seamless no not seamless what's the other one doordash doordash <laughs> whatsapp is not a food delivery service by the way uh <laughs> what's do- some food over <laughs> what's up some food what's up the food this place called dig that i always used to get living in the city that has you know quote healthy food which is it's delicious so it's very high in oil etc but uh, this like chicken, brown rice, sweet potato, Brussels sprout, carrot combination just has me feeling micronutrients supercharged. Man, good. Um, would you ever move back? No, no. But <laughs> just for a few days, it's nice. Yeah, exactly. For for little spurts, little yeah, little work trips. Um, no, I don't. I don't. Personal. I mean, just being closer to family was the main reason for the move, and and I'm really happy where I am. But Good, good. It's been a good trip. How you doing, bro? Dude, I'm good, man. Found out, I was telling you before we started recording that if I like lightly bite my daughter's belly, she'll just start like losing it uncontrollably laughing. So I've been doing that and it's uh, it's hilarious. It's like a, a little baby's laugh is I think like the, the best thing ever. So of course, like I just go over the top with it and just do it over and over and over and over and I milk it for everything that it can possibly be done for. So um yeah, did that. And then uh, my wife and I are starting to look at um, potential properties for buying a home, which is mm. very uh, not fun. So <laughs> 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 I just love, what? I love renting. I absolutely love renting. And uh, the idea of, of buying a home and having a home and all the responsibilities that come with it is not exciting to me at all. So yeah, I have I have really bad news for you. The looking for the house part is not the difficult part at all. So if you're not enjoying the search process, like it's the managing the property that you own that is that is work or outsourcing. But either way, like outsourcing and managing, like not fun. Um, would you ever just continue to rent? I mean, if there was 
literally the perfect property in the in a great school system that someone was renting, then yeah. But like, that's just you want to be in a house. I, I mean, per, for me, if it was just me, I could live in a cardboard box. I don't give a shit. But like, you know, for my wife and and kids and all of that, like, I want them to have a yard. I want that to have a house. Like, yeah, for sure. I don't want to have them in a in a apartment. You know. Yeah, just, and the mar- just for me, the market for renting a house is much smaller than renting an apartment. So correct. Yeah, exactly. Why are you not enjoying the the purchase process or like this the searching process? I it's just it's my personality. I remember so when I went to Westside when I trained at Westside before I went there, my mom was like, "All right, well, you need to get an apartment." And I was like, "Oh, like let's just you know." I'll find one online and, and and I'll just, you know, book it online. She's like, my mom was like, no, we have to go and we have to look at the apartments. And I just hate doing that stuff. Like, I, I don't like it. So we literally went to a high or no, we were already there after Louis, uh, after Louis uh, said, okay, yeah, you can train here after like the two day awful tryout. And so we went like to a, and the I vividly remember, I went to the very first, the first apartment we went to. I was like, yeah, this is fine. I'll just stay here. And my mom was like, no, like we have to see a number of them. And I was like, ah, like I hate, I just, I would just stay here in the shitty little room. So you went to like spend all day going to these different apartments. And I was like, I hate every moment of this. And we did get a great apartment and it was definitely, you know, it was, it was worth it, but I just hated that process. And, uh, I don't know. I just, I would rather not be doing that stuff it's it's shopping i hate shopping like shopping is the worst is the absolute worst i Mm -hmm. don't like it i would rather be doing basically anything else yeah clothes shopping is really the worst but i i get what you mean going to the houses and looking at the properties and that aspect of it it's not it's not the like plugging in your parameters into a zillow or whatever app you're using and like that's okay looking at them, but it's all of the going to look at them in person. The time suck, the energy suck, the fact that you could be doing something else. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Well, but then there's also like, if you're going to be in the house for a long time, there's a, like by making bad decisions in the process and by shorting the front end, you're really like screwing yourself for a long time. There's no question that it's worth it. Like it's definitely worth it. I just absolutely hate it. Like when I'm there, it feels like I'm in school again. It it feels like I'm being forced to sit in class and, and the feeling inside my chest is just what I had every time I was in school. It was just like this, like un unrelenting feeling of just like a tornado inside my chest being like, get out, get out. This is awful. But I have to sit there and listen to this teacher talk to me about geometry. I was like, this is the worst. And so it, I get the same feeling when I have to. It, this is why I work for myself. Because if I had to sit at an office or a desk and do someone else's bidding, it would just be torture for mm. me. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. Hey, do you have your 2023 goals yet? <laughs> I knew, I knew you were going to bring those up. <laughs> I knew you were going to bring that up. I do not have them written out yet, but they will. I can't will... wait till you do. Make sure yeah, to screenshot dude. them and send them over because I'm going to copy your homework. Yeah, you will You will have them. You will have them very, very soon. I think I know one that is, well, actually, no, I don't think this will be a goal of yours, but I do think it will happen in 2023. What? What, what do you think? Purple belt. Oh, man. Yeah, probably, unfortunately. I hope not. <laughs> I might not go to the belt promotion. <laughs> I really don't feel good, man. I'll, I'll see you on Monday. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can't make it. Can't make it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> you yeah. only give yeah. out belts at the promotion. So I guess I'll just be blue belt for another year. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you sign up at a, at a Muay Thai Academy. We'll see. 2023. My, my fitness pillar goals, getting 90 minutes a week of zone two cardio and consistently as a minimum is like the one thing on my mind right now, in addition to lifting. Really? Yeah. Just for heart health? Yeah. Yep. For, for all, all purpose health. Yes. I like that. Primarily hard, but yeah, just making that a habit. Um, but 
Well, when we actually have the goals fleshed out, we'll, we'll come back. So three separate 30 minute zone two sessions a week? Probably two by 45, just because otherwise it's, it's not 30 because like either the first eight minutes I'm not in zone two. So they're really 22 minute zone two sessions, or mm-hmm. I have to do a, a, like a legit 10 minute warm up before. So they're really 40 minute workouts anyway. I think I'd rather do like a, like a seven minute warm up plus 45 minute inclined treadmill walking session twice a week. I think that's probably how it, how it works out. I like that. And it's just, that's just, just two days rather than making it three or four or whatever. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when we have our goals real fleshed out, though, we'll come back here with them. What else is going on? Is is the incline treadmill your 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 method of choice? It's the best, <laughs> the best. I can't even see your video, and I know what face you're making. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, running. I just I just can't stay in zone two running, um, and I I don't have any interest in running. Uh, biking, I've never liked. I've always found it quite uncomfortable. Um, you know, posturally and yeah. And like, yeah, yeah. Sitting on that seat. Uh, ellipticals, ellipticals reasonable. And I think is probably my number two seed, but I really enjoy a good inclined walk started at, you know, 6%, 2.7 speed and gradually increase the percent into the, the 12% range and end up with a speed between three and 3.5 miles per hour for the majority of it. And, uh, and yeah, my heart rate, you know, within 15 minutes is probably in the 130 range and dialed. I feel like your walking pace is naturally like a zone two walking pace. Trying to walk with you is very difficult because I'm a leisurely walker. I'm just like a zigzag, short, short stride, just, you know, we'll take it slow. Mm -hmm. And you're a purposeful walker. Like Walking Mm -hmm. with you is really... I don't care if we're just going to Citarella, the grocery store, going to CVS, just going on a walk around the block. You walk fast. And I was like, oh, man, I got to keep up with this guy. So that makes sense that you, you like the this faster walk, a little bit of an incline. Yeah, that's and, – and a lot of people don't realize how much of a benefit – or I shouldn't say benefit, but uh, how much a slight incline um, increases your heart rate and how much difficulty it adds. Like oh. walking flat compared to 12% doesn't sound like a large incline, but like, tw- or 12 degrees. But if you're walking that compared to flat, like it makes a huge difference. And Dude, it's funny, it's awful. my heart rate hit 148 this morning on, I'm my hotel's probably 20 ish plus minutes away from Gary. And I walked there, um, which felt great. And there's a spot where it's a pretty decent incline. And I was, you know, walking at a brisk pace and yeah. Was the stress of the city at all like increasing the heart no, rate or was that just purely no, was, the incline and speed of the walk? This this is actually my favorite time in New York City, which is early morning on the weekend, mm. which is yeah, the only no one's time out there. that it, yeah, yeah, just, just dead, a ghost town, which is amazing. Was it cold out today? Mm-hmm. I mean, no, not Minnesota cold because coming from, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's at least 20 to 25 degrees warmer. So it felt great, but yeah, it's, it would have been cold for Dallas standards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did a, I did an incline weighted vest walk last night. Um, and dude, yeah, it's brutal. I did that while watching game of Thrones, by the way, oh, that's season one, episode one. Did you finish season one, episode one? Well, I'll clarify for everyone listening. I've already seen it once, the whole series. Uh, no, I did not get to the end of... Wait, did I get to the end of episode one? I have to check now. One sec. Let me look. Oh, yeah, I did. I got to the end of episode one. I started episode two. Wait. Does episode one end with with Bran getting pushed out of the... Oh, shit. I didn't get to the end of episode one. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, man, like fit, mm. finish Batman. Can't believe he died. Like, <laughs> kind of crazy. Anyway, thanks for recommending that movie, Mike. <laughs> Did you finish Batman? Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah, finished during my cardio. Oh, check your phone and see if you actually finished. Oh, nine minutes left. Huh. <laughs> I guess he doesn't oh. die. Oh my God. Yeah. No, I did not finish it last night. Okay. Oops. 
Um, weighted vest is awesome. I've, I used my, my good friend, Jordan Wild, who was my training partner, uh, in the summer after junior year for hockey heading into senior year, his dad had a weighted vest in, uh, in their like home gym. And I remember using it for random stuff then, but I haven't used a weighted vest in many years. And actually that's a great idea for, um, especially just for normal walking, like street walking and trying to get more elevated heart rate. Yeah. It, and it's crazy. You don't need a huge weight on top. It's like 15 pounds and it like is dramatic, mm-hmm. which is pretty crazy. Like thinking about it, if someone, you know, someone gains 10, 15 pounds <laughs> makes things way harder. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Which just shows the opposite, how much easier life can be with a little bit less body fat or being, mm-hmm. you know, going from an unhealthy range to a healthier range. Yeah. Which, which everyone knows, right? Like we're, but sometimes not everyone. even, no, I think, ev- I think everyone knows that maybe not tangibly, like they, they can't feel the difference. They don't know how much better it would feel to, to be healthier. But I think everyone knows like, okay, I, I would feel better if I was healthier. Yeah. Yeah. They're just willfully blinding themselves and posturing on social media to say they wouldn't (laughs) great use of willfully blind see what i did there yeah yeah i did i thought you were gonna say great use of posturing (laughs) that was a great use of posturing too and act i i'm not on that corner of the internet so i don't see that oh god bless you yeah i need to get you on that corner no actually never mind it's a terrible idea my twitter in the last 48 hours got a little more cancerous i don't know why and so i've Try to stop going on there. Yeah. I try not to consume on Twitter. Uh, the plan for this episode is Jordan's D- or Q&A, by the way. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Good to know. None of, none of the <laughs> rants I had. To, it just feels like, a, feels like a pee in an episode. Oh, you know what? Here might be a good one. People, uh, I feel like the coaches like this type of a discussion. What are some cues for overhead press? Mm. Like we could dive deep onto different exercises, like overhead press. Let's talk about the overhead press. Let's do it. Standing barbell. Well, that's, I think, with the first place we could begin. What is your favorite, what is your favorite variation of overhead press? Uh, for myself or for clients? How about both? Okay. And for what purpose? For every purpose. Just give your overall favorite for yourself and your clients and then explain why. Okay. And and I think this is probably similar for both myself and for many clients, we'll say. Um, my favorite, if my purpose is pure uh, strength and hypertrophy gains, is a high incline, back-supported dumbbell overhead press. Um, so what I was doing last night, by the way, when you guessed it on your first shot. Yep. Yep. Um, guess the exercise while, while talking on the phone. That's a good one to play with your friends. If you haven't, uh, we were on the phone and I was like, guess this exercise. Mike listened to me breathe throughout the exercise like four times and he guessed exactly that variation. Yeah. So that was impressive. I, I mean, I knew you were doing a full body workout and, uh, yeah, it, that was, it had to be an overhead press based on the way you were breathing. Um, and then my, my, okay, so that's my favorite for strength and hypertrophy. My favorite overall is probably a standing single arm dumbbell overhead press. And really interesting. Yeah, okay. Uh huh. I, I like that variation. I, I also like a half kneeling, but I actually like the standing variation even more because it requires you to create so much stability through your core. Um, mm. To, to maintain proper position throughout the move uh, that I like that like side benefit, not direct to the, the shoulder or the tricep or, or the, you know, the muscles being worked, but, um, you know, feeling what it's like to properly brace your abs and your glutes and, and to like learn that stable position. Um, and then from the purpose of like a health perspective, I also, I like this relative to the back supported because on the back supported, you're getting very little scapular movement. Um, whereas when you're standing and when you don't have something on your back like that, uh, 
you're getting your shoulder blades moving through that range, uh, which is just, you know, beneficial from a health perspective and for those tissues and, and just learning how to uh, elevate and depress your shoulder blade while doing that exercise. I like that. Upwardly rotate the scapula. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I like that. I mean, so my favorite is definitely the first one that you said that like high incline back supported dumbbell overhead press. Um, I like the half dealing or the standing single arm. Like I like it, but I don't love it. And it's nothing to do with the effectiveness of the exercise. It's everything to do with just my personal preference and uh, like a lot of efficiency. And I'm just like, ugh, I did one side. Now I got to do the other side Mm, (laughs) mm -hmm, mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, I will not, I I will definitely program that if I'm working with someone who does a lot of overhead work, like maybe they're an athlete, volleyball player, tennis, maybe they're a recreational tennis player or whatever it is. I will definitely have someone do that exercise because it's super important for their shoulder health and stability. Mm -hmm. Um, But if I have a client who hates working out and I like, they want to be in and out of the gym as quickly as possible. I'm not giving them many exercises that are, you know, we're going to do one side, then pause, then the other side, just because I know it's going to like increase how much time they spend in the gym. Um, So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, It's funny how we're talking about overhead press and neither of us opted for the barbell. I just, I like the barbell for so many things, but for the overhead press, I think the barbell overhead press is one of the most overrated barbell lifts Mm -hmm. what do you think i mean depending on what you're trying to accomplish right if you're trying to get really good at barbell overhead press because you just read starting strength and you're like this is cool then i think everybody should go through that phase um if what you're trying to accomplish is uh you know get stronger gain lean mass not hurt yourself um, you know, program enjoyable workouts. Yeah, it's definitely not at the top of my list. If we're going to go barbell, uh, the barbell overhead press, I would still go high incline and I would probably, I would probably do it on a Smith machine. Um, mm. I, and, and you got to line it up, right. Right. Because you're on a fixed track there. And, you know, if you're too close or too far away, like it just isn't going to groove. Right. So it takes some practice with a little bit lighter weight to figure out your setup, but I like a back supported high incline Smith machine barbell overhead press, but yeah, like standing barbell overhead press isn't my favorite move and overhead movements in general aren't my, like personally, at least I've just experienced more tweaks, not like real injuries, but more like, ah, my neck, ah, my shoulder going overhead um, and overhead barbell specifically that it's something that I don't do a ton of. Mm. You know what you could also do if you don't have a Smith machine is, and I, I do this very frequently with this exact variation. I'll do like a, a, it's a seated high incline overhead press with a barbell. But if you don't have a Smith machine, you can just set it up. So the bar is like pushing backwards slightly into the rack. Mm right? So you use mm-hmm. the rack as the guide. Mm-hmm. And you obviously don't want to push at a, such a severe angle that you just push directly into the rack, but you lightly press backwards so that the bar is guiding up the rack throughout the whole mo- movement. Movement, So it's still on a fixed track, if you will, but you don't need it to be in the Smith machine. And I love that variation. Nice. I'm into it. Did that make sense? It did. Yep. What percentage of your shoulder work? Um, come and we'll and we'll take rear delts out of the equation so what percent of your non-rear delt shoulder work comes from overhead pressing versus other movements like a lateral raise for example probably about like 50 percent yeah yeah it's about like 50 percent pressing 50 percent lateral raise like and we're not talking about rear delt work so we're not talking about like face pulls or Mm -hmm. uh or rear delt raises or anything anything. Yeah. yeah Yeah. So yeah, probably a 50% pressing and 50% raise type type movements. Cool. What about you? Probably it, either 50-50 max, probably closer to one third overhead pressing and two thirds other movements. Um, just back to like injury risk. Um, 
for myself personally and in general, really, I like going a little bit higher rep on the isolation movements to hit the shoulders compared to heavy compound overhead. Yeah, I just, and this is a, probably a good distinction between goals. Like, I like the pressing because of how it impacts different aspects of my athletic performance. Like, I'm not lateral raising for athletic performance. You know, that's mm-hmm. like, I'm, I'm not doing lateral raise for jujitsu performance or anything like that. Whereas pressing, there's definitely real needs for that and for a lot of those specific movements. Whereas if the goal is just pure hypertrophy or, or even just muscle endurance, then having more raises in there might be, might be beneficial. Cool. Next question. All right. So, I mean, I don't know if you're going to want to talk about this one. So uh, someone said, how can women improve upper body strength? I find it so much harder than lower body and feel like I'm spinning my wheels. Uh, if you want to talk about it, we can. I don't know if I have enough context to give a good answer for this person. Yeah, I mean, I I just spoke about this with someone the other day. Um, oh, actually, I spoke about this with an inner circle member the other day. The reality is like almost always, not not every single time, but almost always, women are going to have a much harder time building upper body strength than men. Like women are like, I mean, women generally are much stronger with their lower body. Uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons why, especially with things like hip thrust, we can see women hip thrusting 405 after not outrageously long doing doing hip thrust. Uh, they're just generally stronger with their lower body. Like, and obviously, like men are, are stronger with their lower body as well, but uh, men have an easier time building upper body strength than women. It's just biologically, I think it's it's generally easier proportions, all that stuff. Um, yeah, and that's and that's not a, an offensive thing to say. That's just an objectively fact. true scientific biological thing to say. Yes, and 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 no one should be offended by that fact. Yeah, it's not saying women are weak. It's just saying that it's going to be harder for you to build upper body strength uh, almost almost every single time. Um, it's why I think, you know, there are many men who the first time trying, they can do a chin up. And for women, it usually takes a long time. I think it's much more impressive when I see a woman doing a set of five chin ups than when I see a guy doing a set of five chin ups. Like when I see a woman doing a set of five chin ups, I'm like, you put in fucking work. Mm-hmm. Like there are some men who like a, a significant percentage of men, I think, who they could just walk up to a bar and do, do a chin up, five chin ups without ever really having trained it before. Whereas like you don't get many women, if any, who can do a set of five chin ups who have, who have not deliberately been trying to do that for probably years. So um, the reality is like the, the other aspect of this, the, and this woman said she feels like she's spinning her wheels is it takes it's going to take an unbelievably long time and the improvements will likely be marginal at best, uh, especially on like a monthly or even every three month basis. You're probably not going to be like, Oh my God, I gained 20 pounds on, on this like upper on this row or on this press. Like it's not, it's probably going to be like a month, two months, three months go by and you put on two and a half pounds, Mm -hmm. maybe something like that. Um, and it also depends on the movement. I know a lot of people get upset when they're like, oh, I don't know why, like I've been training for years and I'm still only lateral raising like 12 and a half pounds. Like, yeah, it's the lateral raise. You're, even when you're at your strongest ever is not going to be a very high amount of weight um, versus something like a dumbbell row. You should be actively seeing more significant uh, improvements on that. But it, I, to feel like you're spinning your wheels, I think it's pretty normal. <laughs> yeah. Especially for a woman on an upper body lift. Yeah. It doesn't e- mean it's not working. Even because it sounds like this woman is comparing her upper body speed of progress to her lower body speed of progress mm-hmm. uh, f- for a guy, for a girl, for anybody, if you're putting the same amount of volume and intensity and effort and, and goal selection on upper body strength versus lower body strength, your lower body strength is going to progress faster. And, and even more so with women, but, but for both, like you're, you can't compare, uh, your bench press speed of progress to your deadlift speed of progress, because if you're doing them both with equal inten- equal intensity and volume, and you have the same amount of experience on both, your deadlift progress is going to be faster than your bench press bench press progress. And then you bring in what you just brought up, which is look at exercise selection. 
Like I've had people be like, yeah, I'm, I'm so weak. I can only, uh, you know, uh, chest supported dumbbell rear delt fly. 15 pound dumbbells for 15 reps and i look at their technique and it's perfect i'm like you're not weak at all like you're we're working a very small muscle group like very small relative to your other muscles and we're not using any other muscles to get the weight up and you especially are not because you're doing it with such dialed technique 15 pounds is awesome on this movement we can't just you know and and most listening to this know that we can't just uh compare like oh my barbell back squat i can do so much and my rear delt raise like I do so little. It's like, no, those are comparing two completely different things. And it makes sense that one is, you know, a fraction of the other. You know, dude, I, I wonder, I, I, I bet a fair amount of people listening to this might think that like, we're dialed in with the analytics on the podcast, who's listening, how many, like, mm. I have no idea how many people are listening to this. And I don't know the demographics at all. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think you do either. Um, I would imagine there there might be a fair few people who don't know this type of stuff or there are new coaches or thinking about becoming coaches and hearing this might be like, oh, like that makes total sense. I wasn't aware of that. But yeah, we don't know the demographics of who's listening. Good point. I just had a, I had a woman who signed up for coaching about a week ago, week and a half, two weeks ago maybe. Um, and uh, And she said, by the way, I just found your How to Become a Personal Trainer podcast. And that is the best kept secret. Like, I thought it was just for personal trainers, but started listening and like, this this is awesome. And and so (laughs) shout out Heather. But yeah, it's it's, when you say that, I think you're right. Um, All right, I'll answer this one. I like this question. You'll laugh. (laughs) Someone said, why does uh, jujitsu give some people cauliflower ears? Mm. So, so this is a, it's a good question. Basically, if you, if you've seen some fighters, if you've ever watched fighters, whether it's a jujitsu fighter, mixed martial arts fighter, whatever, you've seen their ears, like they get puffy, like they get puffy and like they look like cauliflower, like mushed cauliflower. (laughs) It's bad. Um, It's basically what's going on is when you're taking part in one of these types of sports, there's a lot of contact often in the head, the ears will get smushed. So if the cartilage in the ear gets broken, then like it it will release fluid. And at first it's unbelievably painful. I don't have much on on my right ear. I have a, a very small amount. The people watching the video pods can see just a little bit. It's like not much at all, but, um, it's unbelievably painful. And if you want, you can drain it. The issue is if you drain it, it's probably just going to keep coming back. So long story short, it happens because of a, a, a severe contact, like your, your, you know, your, your gets smushed in between someone, someone's head and your head or something like that. Um, there's a joke among some people in jujitsu who say like the only people who have it are people who've gotten smashed, but I mean, some <laughs> of the best fighters in the world have it. So like, it's, it's a lot of it also has to do with, um, the like the your ears like genetically your ears like i have like harder ears like they're they're more they i feel like they're i would only know this i think only people who do these types of sports would know this my ears are much harder whereas like a lot of people if they have very soft delicate ears they're more prone to getting it Mm. um so yeah it's uh it's just based on the contact of people like smashing into your ear or something but it's, it's super painful when it happens. And if you're out and it's 1 a.m. and you're outside of a bar and you uh, <laughs> start start talking trash with some guy and you notice that his ear looks like a piece of cauliflower, run. Or if like, you know, if uh, you're in the parking lot, someone takes your parking spot and you're pissed. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you want to like make a big stink about it and you walk up and you see they've got like these big mushy cauliflower ears just like just walk away just Just walk away get out of there get in your parking spot it's okay there's actually it's not worth it i and i cannot corroborate this this is just what i've been told but it, it makes sense to me that um in russia there are some places like where people you know where where fighting is just very 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 common um and I, I should say, like, mixed martial arts in other cultures is huge. Like Russia, for example, uh, Japan, for example. Like, it's – they're the superstars. Mixed, and we're starting to see it more in the United States. But fighters in, in other cultures are, like, the superstars of that nation. Uh, Japan, China, 
Russia, like they, they, the cultures love fighting. And that's where a lot of the, some of the greatest fight promotions have been born out of like pride. But, um, in Russia specifically, I've heard that people will pay to get, to have someone smush their ear, like to Mm -hmm. like hurt their ear to, Mm -hmm. to get cauliflower ear. And I've heard that the left ear, they charge more for the left ear. And the reason is because when you're driving, the left ear is what is seen out of the window. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so like, if you want to be, look more intimidating, then it would charge you, they'd charge you more to do your left ear. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Absolutely and, crazy. And crazy that people pay for that service. Yeah. It is unbelievably painful. Let's just like smash your ear and then let it, and just, let it. It's, it's like, it's like the synthol of cauliflower ear. It's like, <laughs> it's like none of the work that went into it, but correct. This is exactly a similar right. looking result. Is three times a week enough to see strength improvements? Absolutely it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think three times a week is plenty. And, and we have to differentiate between strength and other athletic qualities, whether it's muscle hypertrophy or, um, there are many other things that we could talk about, but three times a week, like strength. Can we just talk about this for a second? Strength is, I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'm deliberately choosing this word. Strength is easy to build, especially early on. Yep. Like especially within the first year of training. Strength is very, it's so easy. It's so easy to get stronger, especially in that first year of training. Um and I say easy deliberately, not simple. It's literally easy because number one is you don't need to train that often. You could do it three times a week, but even as an advanced lifter, you could do it three times a week and still get super strong. But also you don't need to lift a massive percentage of your one rep max in order to get stronger. As you get stronger and more advanced, you're going to need to lift closer to, you know, 70, 75, 80, 85% of your one rep max. And so then, yeah, like it's, it's going to get more difficult, more challenging. It's not going to be as easy, but when you're a beginner, you could lift 40%, 50% of your one rep max and consistently get stronger from that. So like, like lifting 40% of your one rep max, 50% of your one rep max is, is so it's like, it's lifting nothing. It's like, it's, it's so easy to do that for eight, 10, 12 reps. So yeah, it's, it's three times a week is plenty for anyone, regardless of where you are on the spectrum of of strength. But especially in that first year, getting stronger is literally easy. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you're, we're not discounting, like you need to be consistent. You need to like, right. But, but, but relative to, uh, what most people think they need to do to get stronger. You're absolutely right. And you make a great point about the, the relative intensity needed, which, which is very low to make strength gains as a beginner. Um, yeah, three X a week is plenty to make strength gains. Three X a week is a, a decent amount to make other gains too. Like you, you can, you can make solid muscle gain progress. You can, you know, I especially like three X a week for someone who doesn't want to be training four or five times a week and wants to lose fat and retain muscle in the process and, and retain, maybe build a little bit of strength early in the deficit, but, or retain strength. Three X a week is a great split or great frequency. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, end up wanting to train higher frequency and higher volume, and they aren't bringing enough absolute or relative intensity to their workouts, meaning they aren't training close enough in in poundage to their one rep max. And on their accessory work, when when the absolute intensity is very low, uh, they're not bringing those sets anywhere near failure. So their total intensity is very low. And they're saying, I'm not, I feel like I'm not getting a lot out of this workout. I feel like I'm, um, you know, feel like this isn't doing anything. I feel like I could be doing more. Uh, I actually had a woman say something similar to this. Um, and so I had her send me a couple technique videos because I wanted to see how close to failure she was getting. And she actually was bringing a lot of intensity to, to those sets. And so I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like we can add a little bit of volume here, but for most people who, who say this, um, there isn't enough intensity. They're not lifting heavy enough or hard enough. And you would actually benefit from doing fewer total sets 
and uh, as a result, potentially lower frequency uh, and training harder during those working sets. Yeah. Yeah, it's the truth. I mean, for, I think three times a week is, is plenty for almost every goal, but I just like training more often. It, it's, it's, it's getting out of the apartment, being in the gym, having that time to yourself. Like I like how I feel when I'm working out, when I'm done working out, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily because I think it's better from a results perspective, especially when we're talking about strength or hypertrophy or anything like that. It's, I literally just think it's, it's fun. Like, yeah. I enjoy it. It's a great use of my time. And what would I be doing with that time? Otherwise, maybe when I was, you know, in the grinding stage of my business, train less, wor work more. Mm -hmm. But at this point in my life, it's like, wh what, you know, my daughter's asleep. My wife is getting ready, whatever. It's like, cool, I'll go work out. Like I enjoy it, you know? And you're also doing daily cardio and five X a week jujitsu. So you're like, th th if you were lifting three days a week, like you're doing a lot of total time in the gym. Yeah. 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 But if, if your sole goal was strength and muscle gain, and you really wanted to spend a lot of time in the gym and you weren't doing any sports or anything else, then yeah, bumping frequency can make sense. But yeah, three three day a week training has a lot of uh, a lot of places where it makes sense from a program design perspective. All right, here's another one. Um, I don't know if you're gonna like this one, but it's another <laughs> exercise one. You you um, lead every Q and A of these with either I think you're gonna like this one, or I don't know if you're gonna like this one. <laughs> I think this is a good. One. I I'm starting to like all like the exercise questions that we can sort of break down the exercise and the benefits. As and, long and, as this isn't about a Turkish getup, I'm okay with it. Well, do you want to talk about Turkish getups and how much you hate them? No, we've talked about that before, and I don't actually, I don't objectively hate them. I just hate them because I'm not gonna let. I don't care what studies come out. I don't care what. Krieger or Schoenfeld or any of these guys say like deep in my core, the bro in me, the like, like Arnold Olympia era will never like cross a certain line, no matter what all the science in the world says, just because it's part of my core and my identity. Just because it's annoying to do. No, it's not even that it's annoying. It's just like, just because it's nerdy to do. I'm just not going to do a Turkish get up or program it ever. <laughs> Now, what was it's, the uh, what was the actual question you're going to ask? We've already talked about Turkish get-ups. We don't. I don't want to go in depth on Turkish get-ups. I don't want to hear you talk about the benefits of Turkish get-ups. That's for sure. I wasn't going to say the benefits right. of them. I cool. wasn't going to say that. I was going to say that like hey, it's kid. really annoying hey, to teach it. Hey kid, you'll make a great waiter one day. <laughs> <laughs> that was so funny. I was doing Turkish get-ups in in Boston. Uh, when was it? Like a year and a half ago. It was in it was in August of 2021 and I was doing Turkish get-ups and this, this guy, it looks like he literally just got off work as a construction worker. He was wearing his like Timberland boots. And like, I think I, I, I don't know if I put this on in my head and like my memory of this, that I just like dressed up or like if he actually did have like the, the, you know, like the construction vest to make sure you have like all like the, the construction vest that they wear. Like, I think he was still wearing that. And, and I'm doing Turkish get-ups and he just walks by me. He's like, you'll make a great way to one day, kid. <laughs> 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 oh, it's so funny. All right. All right. Here's a, here's a question. Is there any difference between walking lunges versus doing them in place? Yeah. <laughs> yes, there is. One of them you're walking and the other yeah. one. You bet your ass there is difference. <laughs> one of them you're walking and one of them you're doing it in you, place. Now, you, what, what you, about you can lead different reasonings for, you want me to do this one? Yeah, okay. you can lead on this one. Um, yeah, there's definitely a difference. There's, and there's pros and cons to both. Um, generally speaking, I would say doing walking lunges is a more advanced progression, right? Doing them in place, we could call them static lunges. Um, or even, even let's say something like a reverse lunge where you're sort of technically in place, right? You're not walking forward or backward. You're just staying in the same place and doing a reverse lunge. Um, yet there, that's an easier regression and walking is a more advanced progression. Now, the thing about this is like, it's, uh, just because it's an easier regression does not mean that it's bad or worse or that you should stop doing it once you reach a certain level because a simple way to make an in-place lunge 
ex- make it more difficult is just to, you know, lift more weight, progress with that weight, um, or progress with your range of motion, progress with your technique, progress with the time under tension, any of that stuff. But when I'm talking about a more advanced progression, I'm specifically saying the movement skill required to do it. It, it is more difficult and taxing uh, from a coordination proprioception, perceptual awareness, kinesthetic awareness, it is more difficult to do a walking lunge than it is to do an in-place lunge. Not to mention there is a little bit more stress on the joints and tendons when you're doing a walking lunge because, you know, you have to decelerate and then re-accelerate and uh, absorbing the force. There's a lot more going on. So I'm not going to give someone new to the gym a walking lunge. I will 10 times out of 10 100 times, like 100% of the time, start off with an in-place lunge and then throughout our time working together, progress to walking lunges. Uh, And there are some people who I will never give a walking lunge to. Um, Mm -hmm. I will never give a walking lunge to some people. For example, if I have someone with uh, consistent knee pain, Mm -hmm. I'm not giving them a walking lunge until the knee pain is gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if the knee pain is never gone, then I'm not going to give them a walking lunge. It's just, it's not worth the risk. I will not give someone who's severely overweight a walking lunge. Absolutely not. They, it's, it's, uh, they could get the best, they could be amazing at in-place lunges in every single variation, forward in-place lunges, reverse lunges, static lunges, Bulgarian splits. They could be great on all of those. I'm still not going to give them a forward lunge because the risk is too high. And for that person, I would say, if you want to progress to a, a walking forward lunge, then you need to earn the right through uh, getting to a, a safer body weight because I'm not willing to risk this. And if you want to do it on your own, go for it, but I'm not programming it for you because I think it's too dangerous. So yeah, the um, the stress, the anterior shearing stress that's put on the front of the knee, especially as you're doing a walking forward lunge, requires more strength, more coordination, uh, more ability to decelerate appropriately. So yeah, it's there's there are big differences um, and it's just, it's a more advanced progression to walk. Mike drop, putting on a lunge <laughs> seminar here on the, how to become a personal trainer podcast. Clips um, nation, baby. I don't, I don't think I have anything to add to that. I, I agree. Uh, one thing that I think about when programming, uh, various types of lunges, um, in addition to level of difficulty are, muscle groups most highly targeted and and those differ based on you know are you doing a lateral lunge a reverse lunge a forward lunge a walking lunge a static lunge um and uh as well as what kind of equipment are we using and how are we loading it are you holding dumbbells in each hand do you have a goblet hold with a dumbbell are you barbell back loaded are you barbell front loaded um and and so you know the the further forward you're leaning your upper body and the further forward the weight position is the more you're targeting your glute relative to your quads um and the more the higher up the weight is uh like a a front loaded um barbell front loaded alternating forward lunge you're crushing your quads whereas like a you got the dumbbells by your side and you're doing a reverse lunge you're hitting more glute relative to quad so that that's something I think about in terms of programming lunges, but I completely agree for 99% of our clients, what matters most is um, not hurting, not creating an injury or not re-aggravating a previous injury or just not creating real knee pain and joint pain during the movement. And so programming something that they can do without pain is what's most important. Yeah. Mike, what's the email address for the, for our business? Info at fitnessbusinessmentorship.com. If you want us to, if you have any specific questions that you want us to answer, email that email. Um, But also if you have like any specific exercises you want us to review in this fashion, just send us an email and and we'll do that. I love Um, it. All right, here's a question. Mike, what is the favorite, what is your favorite thing that you did for you in 2022 my favorite thing i did for me yeah what was your are you trying are you trying to get a clip out of me or did someone ask you this and you just changed it to my name or what's uh 
No, someone asked me this. Some oh. boy mums asked, "What's your favorite thing you did for you last year?" Boy mums. Um, um, yeah, boy mums. My favorite thing I did for me. I'm not trying to get a clip out of you. I'm interested. In uh, you. Yeah, I don't think. Okay, good. I don't think this would be a great clip. Uh, what did I do for me in 2022? So what happened in 2022? Trying to get a fucking clip out of me. <laughs> um. What did I do for me in 2022? That was my favorite thing. I'm I'm such an ISTJ. I'm just like, well, I got like adequate sleep in like a dark room and it was cold and like the right temperature and that was really good for my health. And like I did that for me. Uh, like I was I was relatively consistent with my strength training. I could have eaten more micronutrient dense foods, but I did really solid. Um, what did I do for me? Uh, yeah, I don't have a good answer. Jordan, what, how have you been using fasting recently for yourself, if at all? <laughs> just, just a one. Is this, are you building or is this a subject change? This is a subject change because I'm fasted right now and beginning to like need some nutrition and some sustenance. I've been awake for six, seven hours. I don't really fast these days. And I, I'm just, my mouth's watering at the thought of the Chipotle I'm about to go get after this. Um, but do have you been using fasting at all for yourself? And if so, how? I do, but I don't do it deliberately. I'm just, I'm not hungry in the morning. And I also, so there's a couple things. Number one is I'm not hungry in the morning. Number two, and this is probably the most important, is I usually do jujitsu around 10 or 11 a.m. It's, it's one of those two times. And I do not like to eat before I do jujitsu. It's taken me several years of doing jujitsu to really, really internalize the fact that I never am happy if I eat before I do jujitsu, which makes sense. I'm having like someone like smashing me from on top into my stomach. Like I remember one time I had meatballs before jujitsu and it was like the worst day of my life. Um, so I, I don't eat before I do jujitsu deliberately. So yeah, it, because jujitsu is at 10 or 11 a.m., I usually don't have my first meal until like 1230 or one. And um, I don't, it's fun. Like, I don't even consider that fasting, even though I know it is. And I know that's like a form of like a 16 and eight or, you know, a, a 14 and 14 and 10, whatever it is. <laughs> See that math right there? I was like, oh, fuck. I was really feeling the pressure. I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, yeah, I don't even really consider it fasting just because at this point I'm not hungry in the morning and I don't want to eat before jujitsu. And I'm not doing it for any other reason than just because I don't want to eat before jujitsu. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool. Remember a few weeks back when I sent you the picture of the purple raft? the BCA supplement that has yeah. beta alanine in it that I found like in my supplement cupboard. And uh, I just woke up one day kind of angry and just for old time's sake, I was like, we're going to do a fasted lift and threw a scoop of the great purple wrath in with some pre-workout. And it was the worst lift of maybe the last seven to nine years that I've ever had. Oh man. Yeah. Was it because you were fasted? Do you think? I do. I think that had a lot to do with it. Like what time was energy? the workout? It was, it was earlier in the morning. Um, you know, my, my preference is in like the 9am to noon range. And this was probably closer to seven or eight in the morning, but I had had a cup of coffee. I was awake. I'd done some emails and did that fasted lift and I, I didn't even get through it. Um, yeah. I wonder if the purple wrath was still good. How many years had that been in your cupboard? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. I'm actually going to check that. It might've been expired. Dude, I bet that thing was expired 12 years ago. What year, what year did you get the Purple Wrath? 2008? No. <laughs> well, no, no, not in college. I probably 2010 or 11, you know, Martin Birkin recommended Purple Wrath <laughs> and I got it. And That uh, thing was not good. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I'd bought it many times because Purple Wrath with oh, a yeah, scoop yeah. of grape pre-workout was my pre-workout for like 2013, 2014, 2015, or at least 2014. So yeah, maybe it was nine years old. I'll have to look into that. That could have been it. But <laughs> but I I feel so good training on a little bit of food <laughs> rather than fasted. Sample size is low. Might have to give <laughs> the fast nine years old. <laughs> I might have to give the fasted lift another uh, 
another go. But I've I'm such a breakfast guy these days, like between one and three hours after waking and once in a blue moon like today if i'm really doing things and have a decent amount of caffeine i can get away with not eating for the first six seven hours of my day but beyond that yeah what's your go-to breakfast uh a scoop of protein powder which is now half legion half gold standard way which is a real like if you want to dial in your personal finance that's (laughs) that's you know um with uh, creatine in there and five, you really five ounces mix them of cold half water. and half. You, yeah. you don't, you just don't do like one, one day and then one scoop. The other, like you mix. It. It's delicious. <laughs> Dub- Cocoa cereal Legion with double rich chocolate ON with like three to five grams of creatine monohydrate is absolutely delicious and five ounces of cold water. And, uh, and then I have one piece of bread with a little bit of almond butter on it. Oh, that's it. That's your breakfast. Yeah, on on training days. One piece of bread with almond butter and then one scoop of protein in in milk or in water? In water. All I'm looking for is 25 to 30 grams of protein and like 25 plus grams of carbs because I'm going to be lifting an hour after that. Mm. And what about, uh, do do you measure the the almond butter that you put on the bread? Uh, No, I don't measure it. And it's barely any. It's like a, it's like probably less than five grams of fat worth of almond butter shut up yeah less than five grams of fat yeah like a third of the serving size it's very little this is like the the size of a ballpoint pen that's not true it's a little bigger than that but yeah it's very little (laughs) i'm i'm uh i'm not it's not for enjoyment jord eat the cardboard. I do it because if I if I wanted to glob on 30 grams of fat, one, I don't have the fat later in the day. Two, it's slowing the digestion of everything. So I'm going to have a little more in me while I'm trying to get my lift in. Five grams of fat worth of almond butter. Try it. It'll change your life. I need to see a, a video. That should be your first piece of I'm Instagram going content. I'm going to make that. Is, like, is hey. you showing... <laughs> Get ready with me. Here's my, <laughs> my morning breakfast. This is an appropriate amount of almond butter to put on your bread. All right, yeah. everybody, like yeah. five grams worth. Oh, it, does, it tastes dry. It doesn't taste good. Enjoy. Eat the paper. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You have more fats for later in the day. There's more oil in that dinner than you think there is, so it offsets anyway. This is this is the way. That's so funny. This was a fun podcast. I enjoyed this. Oh, we're done? All right. It's it's an hour. The Vikings play in eight minutes and uh, <laughs> it's just worked out seamlessly and phenomenally. My day and my schedule is really working out for me. Thank you very much for listening. We'll be back next week. Weekly uploads, 2023, How to Become a Personal Trainer podcast. Hope you have a great day, a great week, and we will see you soon. Talk to you soon.